This has been a record year for the number of women CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. We're at 5%. I mean, this number is incredibly low. Considering research has shown that organizations benefit financially when they have women in CEO or board positions. But this number has also barely changed since I graduated Vassar College way back in the 1980s. I mean, something is clearly not working. When I was at Vassar, I really believed women could have it all. I mean, the first generation of women managers had paved the way for us, and it was going to be my generation's turn to finally break that glass ceiling and at least have some reasonable representation at the top. So when I graduated and I landed my first job, reality hit. I was working as a software consultant in a large bank in Boston's financial district. And the first day of work, my manager hands me the book, Dress for Success. <laughs> I mean, almost immediately I noticed there was a lack of women managers. I remember when I walked the halls of the 23rd floor, I could see that all the nice offices with the windows were occupied by the men and women sat in cubicles in the center. And even though I was there as a consultant and I had my prerequisite suit with shoulder pads on, as I, right, as I read in the book, I was mistaken as a secretary. So sitting there in my cubicle back then, I remember wondering, you know, what do women leaders look like? And, you know, how are they supposed to act? Well, the following year, I left for graduate school, and I had the opportunity to explore that question as part of my PhD work, and I've been doing so ever since throughout my consulting career. So why have women made so little progress? Well, it's complicated. I think one of the reasons I believe it's been so hard is that the concept of a woman leader violates our deepest stereotypes. The gap between our perception of what we think a leader should look like and our perception of how a woman should act, femininity, has placed women leaders in what has been termed the double bind. That is, if you're a female leader and you act more consistent with the female stereotype, so you're caring, you're helpful, collaborative, maybe even humble, you're well-liked, but you're not seen as competent, right? You may hear people say things like, oh, she's so nice, but you know, she's not up for the job. She's not a real leader. On the other hand, if you're a woman leader and you act more like a man, you're strong, self-confident, and assertive, you're now seen as more competent, but you're not well-liked. You'll hear people say things like, you know, she's kind of bossy, she's difficult to work with, or, you know, the B word. Right. So take Peggy Olson from the TV series Mad Men, which just ended this weekend, one of my favorite shows. But Mad Men takes place in the 1960s, and Peggy represents that first generation of female bosses. If you've seen the show, you see Peggy progresses from secretary to copy ad writer to supervisor. Now, as a secretary, she's well-liked and she's seen as capable, right? She's in a traditional female role. But as she moves up, she starts to get overlooked, she's presumed less competent, and she's not taken seriously. So Peggy starts to act more assertively like her male counterparts. We see she has strong opinions and she holds her team accountable to high standards. Now Peggy's more well-respected, but she's also less than well-received. Yeah, that's her as the aggressive one. <laughs> so as a management consultant at Hay Group, I have the opportunity to study many real life women executives, some who've actually become Fortune 500 CEOs. Now as part of our in-depth research, one of the things we learn is whether these executives are considered typical or outstanding by their organizations. And we also learn about their behavior as leaders from the people who work for them. 
We call these leadership styles. Some styles are more masculine, such as leading by command and control or being authoritative, and others are more feminine, such as being affiliative and democratic. Now, when I compared the styles of the women executives to their male counterparts, I found an interesting effect. Male leaders who were considered outstanding tended to use more masculine styles. Masculine styles, by the way, are in gray if you can't read the slides there. However, female leaders who were considered outstanding used both masculine and feminine styles. Ironically, the female leaders who were considered typical or less effective by their organizations, they looked like the outstanding men. Basically, in order to be a woman leader and to be considered outstanding, you need to be ambidextrous. You need to use both masculine and feminine styles, and we know this takes a lot more skill. Hillary Clinton, this is running from office back in 2008, is a great example of this phenomenon. Early on in the campaign, she came across as strong and aggressive, traits that tend to be more consistent with the masculine stereotype. Her style back then was off-putting to a lot of people. Some called her the ice queen at the time or worse. Now, if you remember, there was a pivotal moment in an interview in a coffee shop prior to the New Hampshire primary. At the time, pollsters were predicting a double-digit win for Obama. When Hillary was asked how she was dealing with the hardships of the campaign, she had an emotional moment. Her voice began to crack and her eyes began to tear as she talked about the importance of getting the country back on track. Well, the impact of that moment was immense. One voter told Newsweek at the time, she said, it got me. I was looking for who the real Hillary was, now that was real. And contrary to expectations, Hillary won the New Hampshire primary. And we know she later lost the Democratic nomination. As we know, she became Secretary of State, which seems in our country to be a more socially acceptable role for powerful women, such as Condoleezza Rice and Madeleine Albright have before her. So as you can see, stereotypes permeate all aspects of our work in society. And they not only impact men's perceptions of women, but also women's perceptions of ourselves and of other women. So what are we going to do to overcome these to make progress? How do we move the dial? Well, I'm not going to take the time to talk about what women can do, because there's been plenty of advice out there. Okay? <laughs> Things such as speak up, ask for the job, show executive presence, and lean in. What hasn't been talked about as much is what organizations can do. And what I mean by organizations are the managers and executives who run these organizations. What can they do to leverage and hopefully advance their female leadership and talent? So here are five pieces of advice. First, managers don't act on untested assumptions. Just because a woman doesn't speak up or ask for a job doesn't mean she isn't interested. We had a story from one woman executive who talked about how she had been passed over for a really key role. When she asked her boss why, he said, well, I didn't think you'd be interested because you'd have to relocate your family and children. Well, she didn't have any children. <laughs> Managers ask before you act. Reach out to your talent before they reach out to you because it's in your best interest. Second, be mindful of the career paths of your female talent. Far too often we see high potential women end up in functions such as HR and marketing, which unfortunately rarely lead to the top jobs. And while women through their careers feel like they're advancing and they're being promoted, all of a sudden you plateau and you realize too late that you missed out on early line opportunities such as managing a P&L or running a sales organization that would have better prepared you 
and positioned you for the top jobs. So remember to watch out and make sure women get in the front lines, not just the back room. Third, make an effort to mentor and even more importantly to sponsor high potential women. Over and over again in our studies, we found that successful women executives have sponsors who watch their backs, give them visibility, support them, and even push them to navigate and advance in their careers. And fourth, for those of you who are senior women executives, be visible and be recognized. I mean, it's really important to understand from the organization's point of view and the women's point of view, your symbolic impact. Because like it or not, as a woman and as a minority, people are closely watching how you act and how you're treated. So be a role model, but also don't take less than you deserve. And finally, for the rest of us, let's value and respect leadership styles that may look different from what we're used to. As I see in, in my career as a consultant, organizations are getting flatter. They're becoming more global and more matrixed. So that the traditional style of leading by command and control is no longer viable. My hope for the future is that our stereotype of what makes a leader also begins to include or evolve to bring in feminine qualities such as being collaborative, being a good listener and engaging others, so that the disconnect between being a woman and being a leader starts to disappear. So until that happens, look to the results that your women leaders are creating. Just because she doesn't act like a male leader does not mean she's not effective. Smart organizations don't just require women to lean in, they go all in. Thank you.